I want to look into the eyes of my son's killer and know his name. The dead cannot cry out for justice. It's the duty of the living to do so for them. Lois McMaster Bujoid, writer. Thank you for joining me for the last lecture in this series on deaf human rights in the state. I want to introduce you to our fictional mother. Let's call her Sally Rose for the sake of argument. Now, Sally, she's a hardworking mother of three teenage boys that she's been bringing up on her own since the day after the children's father died. Life is tough and she has to make ends meet. But like most single mothers, she does her best and is holding down two part-time jobs. She feels a little guilty that she cannot spend more time in her boys' lives. But those are the cards that have been dealt. Two of her sons are doing well in school. However, the third, the youngest, and I'm going to call him Jacob, is not. Jacob is far from doing well at school. Like young boys of his age, he's mixing in the wrong company, constantly getting into trouble with the police for petty things and low-end crime. And Sally is at her wit's end. One day, Sally's worst fears come true. She's at work when she receives a visit from a police family liaison officer telling her that her boy is dead. Shot by police during a firearms operation to prevent a robbery taking place is the story she's told. So an investigation is opened into her son's death. And as in the previous lectures in which we have explored and looked at some of that process, there will be an inquest. However, this one will be different. Suddenly, without any real warning, one day, Sally is told by her lawyers that all the police officers who are witnesses or directly involved in Jacob's shooting want to hide their identities, to be given ciphers, code names. They also want to give their evidence behind screens. This will mean that Sally, the media, the general public, and if the police have their way, as indicated by their first application, her lawyers will be prevented from seeing the officers. So, welcome to this sixth and final lecture in this present series. I want to explore the contentious issue of anonymity, screening, and other protective measures in the context of inquests, and to some extent, public inquiries. By the end of this lecture, we will have examined the competing interests and why they cause such concern for human rights and civil liberty advocates. We will address a number of issues. First, what role does the principle of open justice play in English courts? Why is it important? Second, why do state agents, including police officers, who are used to dealing with dangerous situations, want to be protected and hide behind screens? It's often said to me, what have they got to hide if they've done nothing wrong? Third, what are the protective measures? What are these? And why the fuss? Does it matter whether we know the officer's name or not? What are the benefits for families, the media, and the wider public of seeing witnesses given their evidence? 
Fourth, how should coroners decide whether to order protective measures? What factors should they take into account? And more importantly, are they getting it right? Let's start by some explanations, explaining what we mean. When I say anonymity, I use it to mean that the name or other identifying details of the individual witness are withheld. A pseudonym is used. For instance, Officer A or Officer X. And no questions may be asked in court that might lead to the identification of that witness. In some cases, additional measures may be used to protect the witness. A common one is to screen the witness from the public and the press, or sometimes even from the family of the deceased while they're given evidence. Other methods that may be used include redaction of documents, distorting witnesses' voices, distorting or blurring CCTV evidence. Let's come back to Sally Rose's response when I explain the above to her. She tells me, I want you to know, I gave Jacob life. I experienced the pain of childbirth bringing him into this world. I reared my boy for better or worse. Now a police officer who I don't know ended my son's life. If Jacob was up to no good when his life was ended, this inquest will examine that. No doubt the police will have to account for their actions. And if they were justified in taking my son's life, that will be revealed in court. But do not tell me I cannot look into the eyes of the man who took my son's life when he explains why he did it. Open justice. What is open justice? It is a long-standing fundamental principle of English common law that by default, court proceedings are held in public. The identities of the parties and the witnesses are public. The evidence is heard in public. The judgment is in public and the press are free to report on it. This principle of open justice has been explicitly recognized since the 1913 case of Scott and Scott, that is still regularly referred to as the leading case on the subject. It's been reaffirmed in numerous House of Lords and Supreme Court cases since. However, it has long been recognized, as recognized in Scott and Scott, that there may be some exceptions to this principle. The most well-known exception is for proceedings concerning the welfare of children. In those days, that primarily applied to wardship proceedings. Nowadays, it applies to family court proceedings and concerning children, including proceedings under the Children's Act 1989. Most family court judgments concerning children are anonymized and the press are prohibited from identifying the child. Another exception since 1933 is that the identities of children who are charged with crimes are protected by law. We can all recognize that where the protection of the welfare of children is involved, there can be very good reason to depart from the principle of open justice. But in addition to these general exceptions, it is also possible for the courts to depart from the open justice in an individual case. And that is what we are going to be talking about today. In Scott, the Lord Chancellor, Viscount Haldane, emphasized that judges considering whether to depart from open justice must treat the question, quote, as one of principle and as turning not on convenience, but on necessity, end quote. This principle applies 
just as strongly to coroner's inquests as to any other proceedings. It is an issue of principle and it has to be necessary, not merely desirable or convenient to depart from the principle of open justice. Nowadays, the common law principle of open justice co coexists with human rights law. Several articles on the European Convention on Human Rights are relevant to decisions about open justice. First of all, there is Article 2 and 3 of the Convention, the right to life and the right to be free from torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. These can be relevant to a decision about open justice in an inquest in two ways. On the one hand, if there is a real and immediate risk that a witness will be killed or seriously ill-treated as a result of given evidence without anonymity, a duty will arise under Articles 2 and 3 to give them anonymity. That issue was considered by the House of Lords in a 2007 case of Re Officer L, where a serving and former Northern Irish police officers claimed that there would be a risk of violence to them if their identities became known through them given evidence at public inquiry into a sectarian killing. As claims do, of course, require scrutiny, in Officer L, itself, the House of Lords, reversing the Court of Appeal, upheld the tribunal's decision that, on the facts, the risk of harm to the officers would not be materially increased if they gave evidence without anonymity. Articles 2 and 3 are absolute rights. So if the real and immediate risk test is met, anonymity has to be ordered. But the real and immediate risk test is a high burden to, to, to establish. But even where real and immediate risk is not in play, Article 2 is also relevant in another way. As we've discussed in previous lectures, Article 2 imposes a responsibility on the state to carry out an adequate investigation into state-related killings, which includes adequate involvement of the bereaved family of the deceased. And that may be a strong factor weighing against anonymity. The other rights that are typically in play are Article 8, the right to private and family life, and Article 10, the right to freedom of expression. On the one hand, depending on the facts of the case, having their identity become known may have a big impact on a witness's private and private and family life. On the other hand, the press and others also have a right to freedom of expression under Article 10, which includes the right to report and comment on proceedings. Article 8 and 10 are both qualified rights. That means that neither of them is an absolute right. A decision can interfere with your rights under Article 8 or 10, but that does not necessarily make it unlawful if the interference is proportionate to, to a legitimate aim. In anonymity cases, both Article 8 and Article 10 are typically in play, and neither of them has automatic precedence over the other. The court or the tribunal has to carry out a balancing exercise. And one can see how these two articles may come into conflict with each other. On the one hand, you may have the witness, for instance, a police officer saying, um, my rights of privacy are infringed if my identity becomes known in this high profile case. And on the other hand, you have the press saying, our rights to report freely, you know, the rights of an open press would be infringed if anonymity is granted and the court will have to deal with 
and balance those competing interests. Anonymity and other restrictions on reporting can have a very serious interference of Article 10, the rights of the press. As the Supreme Court said in the case, Read Guardian News and Media in 2010, quote, what's in a name? A lot, the press would answer. This is because stories about particular individuals are simply much more attractive to readers than stories about unidentified people. It's just human nature. And this is why, of course, even when reporting major disasters, journalists usually look for a story about how particular individuals are affected. Writing stories which capture the attention of readers is a matter of reporting technique. And the European Court holds that Article 10 protects not only the substance of ideas and the information, but also the form in which they are conveyed. More succinctly, Lord Hoffman observed in Campbell against MGN Limited, judges are not newspaper editors. This is not just a matter of deference to the editorial uh, independence. The judges are recognizing that editors know best how to present material in a way that will interest the readers of their particular publication and so help them to absorb the information a requirement to report it in some austere, abstract form, devoid of much of its human interest, could well mean that the report would not be read and the information would not be passed on. Ultimately, such an approach could threaten the viability of newspapers and magazines, which can only inform the public if they attract enough readers and make enough money to survive, end of quote. So let's bring this back to the context of inquests into state-related deaths. It's relatively common for police officers involved in death cases to request anonymity. Sometimes this will be because they believe, rightly or wrongly, that they will be in danger of violent reprisals if their identities become known. Sometimes it's because the police force wishes to protect sensitive investigative techniques or sensitive assets such as undercover officers or how they go about acquiring their information. Sometimes the Article 8 rights of the police officers are also relied on. For instance, I've known cases where officers have said they have young families and would be worried about their children being bullied at school if it became clear what they did for a living. As we've already seen, in any such inquest, the starting point is open justice. And any departure from that starting point has to be properly justified. If there is a real and immediate risk to the lives of police officers, which as I've said, is a high standard, a high bar to reach, and given evidence without anonymity would materially increase that risk, then Articles 2 and 3 will come into play, and the coroner will be under a duty to give them anonymity. If there isn't, then the coroner will have to carry out a balancing exercise weighing the principles of open justice and Article 10 rights of the press and others against the arguments for anonymity. And here's the thing, this isn't a simple bin binary, yes or no question. Sometimes an officer will be given anonymity so that their identity cannot be reported in the press, but will nevertheless be seen in court while they are given their evidence. Sometimes, conversely, the officer will only be given anonymity, but will also be screened from the public and the press while they give their evidence. And sometimes the officers will be screened from the family of the deceased, 
And even though this is not my experience, I have been on cases where there has been applications that the witnesses are even hidden from the family's lawyers. The coroner has a duty to consider all of these options while bearing in mind that their duty is to choose the least restrictive appropriate option. Screening the officers from the family is a particularly serious interference with the principle of open justice. There are very good reasons why the family of the deceased generally wants and needs to see and hear the officers given evidence. The first is to secure trust in the investigation. If witnesses give evidence behind screens, this will often make families lose trust and confidence in the investigation. They can suspect cover-up. The second is that families often place great weight on the demeanor and body language of witnesses. For example, families at times decide that they did not believe a witness because they looked shifty, evasive, or arrogant. It might be objected that this is the job of the coroner or the jury, not the family, to assess the witness's credibility. But the family inevitably forms a view about witnesses and they can really lose trust in the process if they are excluded from seeing those witnesses. This is obviously less so if the family's lawyers who are doing the questioning can see the witnesses. But as I've indicated, I have been on cases where an initial application has been made that even the family's lawyers be excluded, although I have not thus far known such an application to be successful. Remember, part of the point of Article 2 and the Article 2 duty is to keep the family at the heart of the investigation. If the family or their lawyers are excluded from seeing witnesses, it's difficult to say that the family is at the heart of the investigation. The third point is to secure accountability. For a family, seeing the officers who are responsible for a death stand up in the witness box and have to answer questions is often one of the most powerful ways of holding the state to account. A fourth benefit is to help to bring about catharsis. Seeing the officers responsible for a loved one's death, explaining what they did can be an important part of the therapeutic healing process. In the 2016 case of Hicks, the High Court quote in the coroner drew attention to, quote, the power of being in the same room as the person that one holds responsible for a death, end of quote. And, quote, a personal element that is lost by not being face to face with that person or those persons. You see, that is why it is very important, in my view, that when a coroner is deciding whether to order anonymity and screening, they scrutinise the application properly. The coroner needs to look at the real reasons for the application and decide whether they are substantiated by evidence. And even where there is a good reason to order anonymity and screening from the wider public, they should not be ordering screening from the family unless there is a very good reason. When it comes to state-related killings where a person has died in or following police contact, these principles are particularly important. I say that for a number of reasons. Firstly, it may well be that the officers are trying to avoid embarrassment, the fact that they've killed someone publicly. Now that's not a good reason for ordering anonymity. As we've seen, 
across the Atlantic in the Derek Chauvin murder trial, it was really important for the public to know the identity of the officers involved in George Floyd's murder. And this is even more so where there is a suspicion that the deceased may have been targeted because of their race or sexuality. As discussed in previous lectures, there is a pattern of black men disproportionately dying at the hands of the police, both in this country and in other countries. In these cases, there is a particularly strong interest in accountability and transparency. That interest is fundamentally undermined if a family feel that they have been excluded from full participation. Examples. Let's think about these principles with reference to some of my experiences representing bereaved families at inquests. In both of my first two police shooting inquests back in the 90s, police officers involved were granted anonymity. The first case I want to make reference to is a case of the death of a young man called James Brady. James was shot dead in 1995 during a bungled robbery at Working Men's Club in Newcastle at the age of 21. In the words of his father, James was a lad with a love of life who had left school at 16 and joined the army and served for three years as a motor mechanic and also played with a military band. His father said, quote, everybody who knew liked him. He was too easily led by his peers, end of quote. The issue in the inquest was whether James's death could have been avoided. The police had detailed information about the planned robbery, but had failed to arrest the suspects instead lying in wait for them at the club. Ultimately, James was shot dead when an officer mistook a small black torch he had in his hand for a gun. James's family believed that he could and should have been arrested outside the club and that his death was avoidable. In that case, as I say, my first ever police shooting inquest, the police marksman gave his evidence from behind a screen and was known only as Officer A. This was made after an application that whilst there was no evidence to suggest any link with the Brady family, it was said that the officers were fearful of the criminal underworld wishing to take revenge on the officers anonymity was granted. The same was repeated in my second ever police shooting inquest, where a man called Mick Fitzgerald was shot dead in his home by a police marksman as a culmination of a siege situation. Mick, a former railway worker, was aged 32 when he died. Friends and family described him as being a big gentleman a huge John Wayne fan who had a pair of cowboy boots in homage to his hero. Unfortunately, he suffered from depression. And when police were called to his flat by his girlfriend, who mistakenly believed he was being burgled, the police mistook him for an armed intruder and laid siege to the flat. An officer, believing that he had a handgun, shot him. At the inquest, the police made an application for anonymity. On behalf of the family, we strongly objected to the officers being given anonymity. It was pointed out that there was absolutely no threat of abuse or fear 
from the friends and family of the deceased. And it was insulting to them that this could even be inferred. However, the coroner overruled our objections and granted the officers anonymity in screening. This anonymity direction was particularly troubling and the local newspaper, the Bedford on Sunday News, decided to challenge this decision because of the right of the media to see witnesses and the principle of open justice. Their application in the High Court failed. It's important to note that in this case, there were other complaints the family had, such as the fact that the coroner had failed to disclose many witness statements and nor, neither the police radio logs and transmissions had been um, disclosed to the family. And as we've discussed in a previous lecture, in those days, the bereaved family had no automatic right to disclosure of evidence. And in this case, when the coroner asked the police officer to demonstrate how he'd laid siege to the flat, and the officer mimed, pointing a gun at him, the coroner raised his hands in mock surrender and laughed. It was an unfortunate incident in court, and the family found it particularly insensitive. The conclusion of this case, the coroner decided not to leave any options to the jury and directed that the jury had to return a verdict of lawful killing. This case and cases similar illustrate the problems surrounding why anonymity can be problematic and why anonymity can contribute to a feeling on the part of bereaved families that they are being excluded, marginalised and treated with disrespect. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not to say there is never good justification for anonymity or screening, but that they should never be granted simply on an officer's say-so without proper scrutiny of the application. What happens nowadays is that there is a full risk assessment done, which is provided to the court, indicating what the risks to the officers is said to be. The limits on the coroner's powers. I also want to mention that while a coroner in an inquest can order anonymity in screening, there are some limits on what the coroner can order. In some other cases of judicial proceedings involving highly sensitive information, such as national security information, it is now possible to have a closed material procedure where a court holds closed hearings from which the parties, or I should say, from which some of the parties are excluded and receives closed evidence that some parties have no access to. This type of procedure was developed in the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, or SIAC, as it's commonly known, for immigration and nationality cases involving national security issues. It has since spread to other types of proceedings. The Supreme Court held in 2011 in a case called Al-Rari against the Security Service that a closed material procedure was not possible in the civil courts without express authorization by parliament. The government then brought forward the Justice and Security Act 2013, which authorized closed material proceedings in civil proceedings. In inquests, however, it is still not possible to have a closed material procedure, as was confirmed in the 2010 case of the Secretary of State for the Home Department against the Inner West London Coroner. What this means in practice is that although a coroner can keep the witnesses anonymous and can have the witnesses screened from the family, the coroner has no power to exclude the family 
from the hearing altogether or to hear evidence in the absence of the family. Because of this, there are occasionally cases where the police material involved is so sensitive that a closed material procedure is needed, meaning that the inquest is not an adequate forum for the determination of how someone died. This was the case in the death of Azel Rodney and in the death of Anthony Granger. Azel was killed by the Metropolitan Police, Anthony Granger was killed by the Greater Manchester Police. Both cases had to be converted into public inquiries where a closed procedure was permitted. Inquiries, as I've said, can and do hold closed material, material procedures. Self-evidently, this kind of procedure should be a last resort. And indeed, it remains rare for an inquest to be converted into an inquiry in this way. I want to turn to a case called Dyer. Let's go back to inquests. I want to talk about a death of a man called Andrew Hall, a black man who died after police contact. I will not say much about the case because the circumstances of this case are, are such that the inquest is currently ongoing and it would be inappropriate to do so. But I do need to talk about a decision of the coroner in Andrew's case to order anonymity in screening. This case, went to the Court of Appeal and is now the leading case on um, screening and, uh, and anonymity in inquests. And it would be remiss of me to be given this talk, not to be able to touch upon it, even given the timing of Andrew's case. Andrew's partner, Natalie Dyer, challenged the decision of the coroner to screen in the High Court by way of judicial review. And that decision was successful. It was then appealed to the Court of Appeal. In this case, the police had sought anonymity in screening, not just from the public, but from Andrew's family, because they say that they had fears of violence from a member of the family. Now that family member was not involved in the proceedings, but the officers said that they perceived the risk that if their identities were disclosed, um, they would feel threatened. The family in their submission strongly disputed this and there was ever such a real risk. The coroner granted the order for screening and this was challenged, as I say, by way of judicial review. The High Court agreed with the family. The High Court judge decided that the case for screening against all the officers was not made out. However, the police appealed to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal reversed the decision of the High Court by a majority decision. The Court of Appeal was split 2-1 over whether the screening order had been appropriate. The majority in the Court of Appeal held that the coroner, in that case, had carried out an adequate balance and exercise and had taken the principles of open justice as his starting point. However, it is noteworthy that the coroner in Dyer had not found that the officers Article 2 and Article 3 rights were in play. It seemed to me that it was arguable that the coroner, which the High Court and, the, and at least one Court of Appeal judge agreed with, did not properly weigh the alleged risks posed against the powerful public interest of letting the family see the officers. And I also think that the majority of the Court of Appeal may have been mistaken in law to treat the, the case as a mere review of the coroner's decision-making process. I accept, of course, that in ordinary judicial review, the court simply reviews the legality of the decision-making process. It does not make the decision for itself, but it's well established in English law that there is an exception to this rule where human rights under the European Convention on Human Rights are at stake. In such a case, the court has to decide for itself whether the human rights have been breached. And there is also a case at a Supreme Court level, 
Kennedy against the Information Commissioner, which suggests the same is true where, common, where the common law principle of open justice is at stake. So now we have conflicting um, Court of Appeal decisions. This is particularly troubling as the Dyer case is a binding authority for coroners and it may well have set back the fight for open justice in inquests. So let me come to my conclusions. This is the last lecture in this series and I want to wrap it up by saying that throughout this lecture series I've tried to look at the coronial process not through the eyes of lawyers or judges but through the eyes of the bereaved family. As we've seen, brief families are, have been often excluded, marginalized, ignored, and treated with disrespect and contempt in the coronial process. Over the course of my career, I've seen some improvements, but there is still a long way to go. I am emphatically not saying that there is never a good justification for anonymity and screening of police officers in an inquest. Sometimes there is a genuine, a real threat to an officer's life. Sometimes there are highly sensitive investigative techniques involved or undercover assets who could be put at risk. So I do not want to say that there can never be a good reason for departing from the principle of open justice in an inquest. But in my experience, there is a danger that the police will ask for anonymity too readily and they are given deference and often receive it too readily. And the principle therefore of open justice is often given too little weight. And even where it is necessary to screen an officer from the public and the press, coroners should be very, very reluctant to order screen from the bereaved family of the deceased such a decision seriously impairs the right of the bereaved family to meaningfully participate in the inquest. It often leaves them feeling like transparency and justice are being denied to them. And it can be insulting, particularly where the justification for the screening is that they or someone they are associated with poses a threat to the officers. I conclude, therefore, by repeating the central message of this whole lecture series. The coronial process needs to centre the bereaved family, the person who's lost a child, a spouse or a parent, is entitled to know the truth of what happened. And wherever humanly possible, they should be able to look into the eyes of the person responsible for the death and hear them explain themselves. Too often, our courts have lost sight of that principle. Thank you for participating and following me on this journey along these six lectures. And I do hope that you will come and attend the, the lectures in the next series that starts in the autumn.